Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's NeuroTools webinar. Uh, today, we'll be hearing Tools of the Trade from Data to Results in Neuroimaging, presented by Dr. Satrajit Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is a principal research scientist at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT, and he's an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology. I think I got that at Harvard <laughs> Medical School. <laughs> He's also the director of data models and integration project of ReproNim, an NIH P41 Center for Reproducible Neuroimaging Computation. His research interests span computer science and neuroimaging, specifically in the areas of applied machine learning, software engineering, and applications of neuroimaging. The primary focus of his research group is to develop knowledge discovery platforms by integrating a set of multidisciplinary projects that span precision medicine and mental health, imaging genetics, machine learning, and data flow systems for reproducible research. He is also a lead architect of the KneePipe data flow platform, an ardent proponent of decentralized and distributed web solutions for data sharing, querying, and computing. He's also a strong believer in solving problems through collaboration and crowdsourcing. Dr. Ghosh, thank you so much for joining us today. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand the reins over to you. I just wanna remind everyone in the group chat that we will be doing a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the group chat. And thank you once again for joining us, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, Devon, and thank you, Anita, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of uh, a different kind of talk. It's not going to focus on one thing in particular, but rather a set of things, uh, tools that we use in our group uh, to go from data to results in neuroimaging. Now, some of these tools, and I'll point out, could be general purpose tools, and some of these tools are going to be focused on neuroimaging uh, solutions to problems. And so without further ado, before I uh, get started. I want to acknowledge that a lot of things that I'm presenting over here is really the culmination of work by many collaborators and individuals uh, around the world. And uh, many of the tools I will be talking about could themselves be talks for this NeuroTools seminar series the, uh, on their own right. Uh, but I'll, my goal here is to kind of show an entire flow through the neuroimaging uh, data to results space. So just to give a little bit of background in the kinds of things my group works on, we think we look at trying to inform health. And uh, while most of our work is focused on mental health and neurodegenerative disorders, what we mean by informing health is can we predict things like treatment outcome? Can we track an individual to see or shape how uh, changes take place uh, in their mental health uh, over time? We're also interested in ensuring that our results are reproducible and more importantly, generalizable. And so we develop a lot of analytic platforms uh, to help us to do things reproducibly. And I'll be focusing a lot on that uh, in this talk. And finally, an area that we have gotten into over the last few years is this idea of longitudinal phenotyping. The fact that we can track information about an individual over time that comes from various kinds of sensors, whether it's your mobile phone, your wearable, or your brain images, and how that might inform us in changing health habits or other things. So our sources that we get in our group are brain images, uh, smartphones, wearables, uh, genetic information, clinical records. Uh, we don't yet get microbiomes, uh, but that can be seen as part of the do doing deep longitudinal phenotyping. But given the diversity of data we tend to get, there's a whole assortment of things that we need to have at our disposal in order to process the data, in order to ask questions of the data. And this data flow in brain imaging really covers this entire spectrum because all the types of data, phenotypic or genotypic data that you're getting is really at one end of this workflow. And we want to not only get information about the participant, uh, the experiment, we also want acquisition details. How were data captured? And then we have the raw data. We need to structure it in some ways. And then we need to analyze it through various kinds of workflows. We finally get to derive data, and that's typically dependent on the question uh, that one has, uh, what kind of hypothesis somebody's testing or building a machine learning model. And we get to publications and sharing the data. So. We, 
for almost any research in brain imaging, they're really going across an entire spectrum of things. And many of the tools that I'll talk, be talking about are really intended to target different pieces of this puzzle. So I'm gonna start with on the things on the side of general purpose tools. And this kind of should be broadly applicable across scientific domains, not just neuroimaging. And one of the things we try to ensure in our group is that everybody versions their code. And we use GitHub for it. Uh, their, uh, GitHub is freely available for open source projects. Uh, if you're a business, you can do other things uh, to pay for GitHub. But there are other platforms like GitLab as well, which allow you to, and Bitbucket, which allow you to version your code. So there are plenty of choices, but the key is you want to be able to version your code. Then testing your code. If you're writing code for various things, even if it's a small script, you want to ensure that your code produces the same thing every single time. So we do things where we link up with external code testers and give them data and tests and code to ensure that our code is doing what it's supposed to do every single time. And one platform I highlight over here is Circle CI, but there are other platforms out there. Uh, Travis is another one as well as uh, Jenkins, which is something that you could install on your own servers. Now, one thing I should point out uh, before we go further is that for every slide over here, there's a little URL at the bottom that'll link you to the slide and the slides themselves will be, will be available uh, after this talk. Finally, after you've versioned your code uh, and tested your code, you also want to version your environment. Uh, and there's quite a bit of uh, variability in how people compute or do computation. There are a few general solutions out there, so there, I'm sure many of you have heard of virtual machines. Uh, they represent one way of getting an encapsulated environment. There have been advances in, in what is called containerized technologies, and uh, two fairly popular technologies these days are Docker and Singularity, and they serve different purposes. I won't go into the details of what the differences are. Happy to answer questions about them later on. Uh, but both of them exist as fairly powerful technologies that one can use to run code in a very specific environment. And I'll talk about some of the extensions we've done on top of these technologies to create things specifically for neuroimaging. Uh, finally, uh, this may not be completely uh, something that everybody knows about. Uh, there are two projects. One is called Project Jupiter. I think many people have heard of that. And there's another project called Binder, which is now being taken over by Project Jupiter. So Jupiter itself allows us, and we use this routinely in our group, uh, to create what are called notebooks. And these notebooks help us create interactive pieces of code uh, to test around things, to share with others, to display on the web. And so we use JupyterLab quite a bit in our group. Uh, and Binder is kind of a counterpart to this, where if you have your code repository on GitHub uh, and it has a collection of interactive notebooks and a few other files that tell Binder how to set up the environment, you can point to your GitHub repo and Binder will create a container uh, for you to run uh, your code interactively through Jupyter on the web. So it provides a very easy way to distribute code or to have people check out things of, uh, about your code repo. Uh, so moving from the kinds of electronic notebooks, versioning data, and I believe Dr. Halchenko, uh, or Yarek for short, uh, gave one of these talks a couple of weeks back, and he talked about Datalad. And so I won't go into the de details of Datalad, but it is a general purpose tool to version different kinds of data. And finally, we believe in creating and using open software. And there's a whole host of things that are useful in neuroimaging, and many of them are open. And we'll be talking about some of these over the next 30 to 40 minutes. So now we want to connect these dots going all the way from data to publishing. And in particular, I want to focus on sort of six areas. And I would say that even before you start acquiring data, you're often interested in search and you want to find out about the different kinds of data that are relevant to you and that are available for you before you collect your own data. Because there might be the scenario that something you're asking can really be answered with publicly available data or privately available data that you could do without collecting new data. 
the second thing, acquisition. So we've been building some platforms that help out with acquisition. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, harmonization, to actually take most advantage of the various analytic solutions out there, it's useful to take data that comes in and harmonize it th through some standard in a consi consistent manner so that analytic processes can leverage that. And I'll be talking about a few standards we've been working on in that space. Uh, analytics, this is fairly large. Uh, I will be touching upon just a few things that we deal with in our group rather than the broad spectrum of ana analytics available in neuroimaging. Uh, the Final two things, they're kind of unrelated to each other directly, but they somewhat may be related because you can publish these notebooks and other things with visualization. One is often in neuroimaging and other domains, you want to visualize data. And there's a whole assortment of tools that are out there. And we've been doing some uh, development in that space in moving forward uh, interactive visualization in the neuroimaging space. Uh, and finally, publishing. And publishing is a whole host of things. It's publishing data, publishing code, uh, publishing your notebooks or papers. And we'll be talking about some of those. And finally, I'll end with some upcoming platforms that we are working on right now to help um, address many questions along these different spaces. So let's start with search. Well, one of the nice things about uh, the world of neuroimaging is that several people have put an incredible amount of effort uh, to share data online. And one such place is the Child Mind Institute in New York. And <coughs> uh, what they have been able to do is, together with Amazon's public data sets program, put a bunch of data. Uh, these are related to what's called the Thousand Functional Connectomes Project, the Indie Prospective and Retrospective, and more recently, the Healthy Brain Network study that puts data on online. Uh, so credit for this goes to Cameron Craddock and Michael Milham for spearheading many of the things, but there are many people involved outside of them. Uh, since such data is available, one of the things we did as part of a small project a few years back was to create an interactive interface to comb through the data to find out which data sets have MRI, what kind of diagnosis, uh, and th a lot of this is predicated on the fact that the Child Mind Institute was able to share a lot of data from different institutions and researchers around the world through this common platform. And we were able to take just the MR images from these data sets coupled together with phenotypic information and provide an interactive framework by which people could select through and find the data they were looking for. That same kind of uh, idea has been around with open fMRI for task-based fMRI for a while. And that has extended into the what's called the open neuro platform that uh, Chris Gorgolevsky and uh, Russ Poldrak and his group are building. And while it started off with task fMRI data sets, it's now extended to a whole collection of data around uh, brain imaging, ranging from MR imaging to EEG and MEG, and in some cases, simultaneous EEG and fMRI as well. And this is a platform that's upcoming and people can submit things. I'll talk a little bit about this later on in the talk. Finally, with a lot of these data available through public sources, that same tool, Data Lab, uh, which I referred to earlier, allows you to search and uh, bring together the data on to your local computers, uh, specifically limiting it to things that you need. So if you are interested in, let's say, just the T1 images, which are structural images often of brains, you don't need to download full data sets to get just those T1 images. You can simply download uh, the T1 images through DataLad from these different sources. And that's something quite powerful because now you can uh, use data temporarily knowing that the version of your data that you're looking for is there somewhere remotely and you can pull it at any point in time. So there are these big data or open data resources, uh, but there's also a bunch of other resources that come out from various uh, data consortia, uh, which should not be ignored because there are things that, even if you don't have direct access to it uh, through things like Data Lad, you can register and get access to it, and they might be useful for questions that you have. 
And so some of the, uh, the consortia that do retrospective data are Enigma, uh, Indy, which is open, uh, and the NDA, which formerly was NDAR. So NDA stands for the NIMH Data Archive, and they have an extensive collection of uh, imaging scans uh, across, mostly from autism, but generally across a whole lot of participants. And then there's prospective data consortia, uh, things like the ADNI, the Human Connectome Project, the ABCD Project, and the UK Biobank. They have different levels of accessibility, and you will need to go through certain MTAs or other types of uh, signatories to get access to some of these data. Uh, the ABCD data, for example, is available through the NDA. So once you get access to the NDA, you can apply for access through ABCD. And already they have close to 4,500 uh, subjects uh, available through the NDA platform. Uh, finally, it may not just be about raw data. So Neurosynth, uh, which is a platform built by Tal Yarconi, uh, who's at UT Austin, uh, is an avenue to get at uh, meta-analytic data. So Neurosynth uh, allows automated synthesis of fMRI data and from publications and results in these meta-analytic maps that you can use for your own studies. And we take a look at this in various ways to inform hypotheses, to test certain a priori uh, regions that come out of such meta-analytic uh, analysis. And finally, uh, when it comes to searching, uh, there are things like neurostars.org where you can ask questions, not just about software code, but neuroscience in general. And there are channels of communication. So brainhack.org has a Slack channel, which is a very active uh, channel for people doing neuroimaging and asking questions about various things. Uh, the final place, which is somewhat of a weird place to get data from, are challenges. And this is an example of a challenge on the Kaggle platform that was held in 2014. But every once in a while, uh, various neuroimaging challenges are put up. Right now, there's a challenge going on on depression uh, with structural images. Uh, that's uh, going to be, the results are going to be announced during the upcoming uh, OHBM meeting. But these challenges are also an interesting place to get at data and not just any kind of data. Sometimes you get the supervised data sets which allow you to play with or participate in these challenges and, and test out your machine learning codes. So we do participate in some of these challenges both as a way of improving our tool set but also to get access to certain data sets that otherwise would not be possibly available. So having gone through the ways in which you can get at different kinds of data, whether it's data or metadata or uh, meta-analytic data, uh, we want to now look at the ways in which, in our group, we'll take care of acquisition. And the first thing I want to point out to is an effort by Chris Gorgolevsky and uh, Yaroslav uh, Halchenko called Open Brain Consent. Uh, since data acquisition involves consent, uh, one of the things they've been trying to do is to make data sharing become easier. And the first place to start is to ensure that your consent form is right there uh, enabling such data sharing. And so they have a couple of examples and, uh, in, on the website, but it's the place where you want to start when you want to think about acquisition. It's creating a consent form that's uh, respective of data sharing practices, uh, that respects people's privacy, and allows people to consent to, by their choice, whether they want to have their data shared or not. Uh, the second piece that we've been working on um, is collecting phenotypic data. Now there are many, many platforms out there. There's RedCap, there's Open Clinica, uh, and there are other tools that people use to collect phenotypic and clinical information. Uh, we started creating a cross-platform electronic laboratory notebook uh, which allows individuals to plan their experiments, collect, analyze, and reuse uh, data, and most importantly, collaborate with other people. This is a fairly uh, nascent project, so it's in its early level of maturity, unlike many of the other things that I've talked about till this point. Uh, but a key reason why we wanted to do this is when people save their data in various ways, whether it's saving to CSVs or sharing their data, Often, semantic annotation is in the form of a PDF or a Word doc uh, that comes along with a data set, and somebody has to go through and understand these things. These things are not generally machine accessible, 
and not standardized in any meaningful way. Uh, one of the key elements of Brainverse is to annotate data with relevant metadata based on a very specific model, and I'll talk a little bit about this model later on, to ensure that the neuroimaging study materials ca can be reproducible, and in particular, making data fair. We also wanted to intercept the research workflow at the planning stage. So if we can start getting people to use this platform right when they're planning their experiments or their designs, uh, we can ensure that we calibrate and curate the data in structure from right from the beginning, as opposed to having collected data and now having to go back and reorganize the data for distribution. And as I mentioned, there are a few other electronic data capture systems out there. They lack semantic annotation capabilities. Uh, we tend to use something called a graphical uh, database model underneath to save the information. And they don't have query capabilities, all of which are natively part of this Brainverse environment. And just to give an illustration of some of the things we've been doing, uh, I mentioned the NIMH data archives. Uh, they have a way uh, of accepting data from individuals. And you download a form, you fill up information in there, and you submit this form to the NDA for data submission. We have a way of editing these forms and curating them so that the data you collect right from the get-go uh, is conformant with the future submission you'll need to make when you submit your imaging and phenotypic information to the NDA. Uh, it also has a general purpose instrument editor or a form builder to create your own new data acquisition forms. And more importantly, it has this experiment planner that integrates your scheduling of your experiments together with these uh, modules, these forms, uh, to allow individuals to collect data as you would in a planned experiment. Uh, this is slightly different from neuroimaging, but as I said, we are dealing with a lot of phenotypic information. And one of the things we've been working on is this idea of collecting voice data uh, that we analyze to track improvements after uh, voice therapy or voice surgery, but also to predict things like depression and Parkinson's states. Uh, and this was a framework uh, that's a mobile platform framework. It's all open source that was created to allow individuals to uh, speak into their phone and uh, do surveys on the phone on a daily basis, on a longitudinal basis. And then more importantly, one of the key elements we wanted to do with this is that each person gets their own account on a database server, and they can decide how long they want to submit data to that account, and they can delete their account when they're done with the study. Uh, while they have the account uh, as part of their consent process, they give us permission to access their data and process it, and we can keep that data once they're done with the study, but they have control over what's in their account and how much they want to share it with anybody else. Okay, so that gives us getting uh, phenotypic and data in that's from behavioral or cognitive things. Uh, I won't talk much about the data acquisition from the MR side, that's a fairly well-established project, but we have been doing things even there to convert data that's coming in to structured form. And that's where harmonization really comes in. So as one can imagine that a lot of information out there is unstructured. And while tools are being built to deal with such unstructured information, uh, there are several efforts that we are ourselves part of which have been looking at structured information uh, for imaging data representation as well as phenotypic details. And two such, thing, two such uh, areas are the brain imaging data structure or BIDS uh, and the NIDM effort, uh, the neuroimaging data model. And both uh, represent structured information in slightly different ways. Uh, I would say that the primary difference uh, besides details of data structure are that the NIDM representation has a little more semantics that are part of the structured representation, uh, whereas with BIDS, you have to read through a document to understand some of the semantics associated with the structure. But they're both structured representations. In particular, BIDS, uh, which was a joint effort uh, uh, driven by INCF, uh, is trying to get structure across neuroimaging data. And this is not just MR data, it's MR, PET, EEG, MEG, uh, all coming together into a structured file system layout 
with uh, standardized conventions for naming things that enable, again, people to develop things and to look for things efficiently. Uh, the metadata uh, information is captured through JSON files typically, and that helps uh, describe some of the data that's in there. And this software support for data in bits format in various ways, I'll be referring to a couple of these a little later on. Uh, and you can run software just by pointing it to these bids uh, data stores. And as long as it's in a bids format, the software will figure out if it has the right set of data to run itself on and will run things. The neuroimaging data model, on the other hand, was intended to cover a slightly more complex space of information. Uh, when you represent uh, neuroimaging information, you not only want to think about data from a view perspective, who are the people participated, uh, you want to understand it from a provenance perspective, how data was transformed, uh, who transformed it, and how do you capture all of that information. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this model, but suffice to say that we wanted to break information up into experimental details, workflow details, and results details. But we also wanted to build on a set of technologies, in particular, these PROV family of specifications, which were explicitly created to track the provenance of information and transformation that takes place on that information. One of the things that has come out of this, and this is relevant to almost any group doing neuroimaging, is as you start digging into these uh, software tools and trying to figure out how to represent information, you start realizing that there are differences in the way different tools model data. In this particular slide, uh, this is a reference to the three most popular imaging packages doing modeling of error uh, in fMRI in different ways at the individual subject level, which is the first level, and at group level uh, for statistics. And these differences can have an impact, but that kind of investigation also allows a conversation about why these differences exist, what assumptions are these models making. And that's something that comes out of trying to encode semantically annotated information into a data model. So now that we've gotten from data uh, harmonized into a consistent structure, uh, we can go to analytics. And my group uh, uses a lot of tools from the neuroimaging in Python, uh, NiPy or NiPy, as different people may pronounce it, uh, uh, community. And we use probably 75% of the tools listed over here. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm going to highlight a few things that uh, our group is particularly involved in. Uh, one of the key things that we've developed uh, is this infrastructure called uh, NiPipe or NiPipe. Uh, and the general idea behind this is to create a Python framework that allows individuals access to the whole assortment of imaging tools that are out there through a consistent and uniform Pythonic API. On top of that, you can take that API and construct workflows uh, based on these interfaces and execute these workflows across uh, various distributed compute services, whether you're running Slurm or SGE, uh, or even locally on a multi-core computer, you can use the same execution graph uh, and run things without, by just having to change what your end target is for execution. And so we take a whole host of idiosyncratic, heterogeneous APIs and turn them into a uniform way in which people can interact with these tools. Uh, the workflow engine, I would say, is a very general purpose uh, engine. The interface part is where it's neuroimaging specific that we support a whole lot of interfaces that are focused on neuroimaging. The workflow engine could be used for any general computation if you wanted to create graphs that could execute locally and in remote clusters. Uh, to support this, and one of the things we do is use the uh, MyBinder service. Uh, there's an extensive tutorial created by one of our community uh, contributors that allows individuals to learn about NiPipe in depth on their browser without having to install a single software. But if they wanted to, they could also use this to learn how to install NiPipe on their systems and learn how to create their own workflows. Uh, this is a Python framework, so you, uh, Python is a necessary requirement to using NiPipe, but a lot of it is fairly templated, and once you get the practice of Run, writing these workflows, it becomes fairly straightforward. 
for those who may not want to write Python, uh, although this is not quite at that level of sophistication yet, you may need, still need to make a few changes and need to know some basics of Python. There is a graphical interface which another community uh, contributor, Tim van Morik, uh, out of the Netherlands created, which allows graphical creation of workflow, NiPipe workflows, uh, and that can be executed in uh, consistent environments, and I'll be talking about those environments in a second. But instead of writing Python code, you basically draw blocks in, attach them, connect them up to your data, and run them. And Porcupine has an extensive set of uh, documentation to get you started and how it maps onto NiPipe semantics. Finally, uh, this is probably where uh, it's been really nice to see uh, NiPipe become a basis for some fairly uh, extensive tools out there. And I'm going to go through them in a clockwise manner, uh, starting with CPAC on the top left. So CPAC uh, stands for Configurable Pipeline for Analysis of Connectomes. This was spearheaded by Cameron Craddock's group. Uh, and what this provides is a general uh, graphical approach to selecting components of your pipelines and being able to run different kinds of analytical pipelines and is built on top of NiPipe as, as a way of executing those pipelines on different machines. It started off with automated processing and analysis of resting state fMRI data, but its general capabilities extend beyond just resting state data. Uh, the second tool uh, is Mindboggle, and this is focused on analysis of structural or anatomical data uh, from T1-weighted MR images. And it builds on to very popular uh, software tools out there, Ants and FreeSurfer, but tries to break down pieces of the brain into what is coherent across individuals and looks at properties of these pieces as opposed to doing general things like registration across individuals, which introduces uh, different kinds of registration error. And again, Mindboggle is built on top of NiPipe as a workflow to run through things um, for extracting these different features. And one can use those features for machine learning uh, use cases and other uh, group level comparisons. fMRI prep, uh, actually, I'm gonna flip things around. I'm gonna talk about MRI QC, which is on the left. Uh, is uh, a workflow that is focused on uh, predicting the quality and reporting the quality of MRI scans. And it does quality assessment of both structural and functional images and provides uh, extensive features that could be used as covariates that could be used to understand uh, if your quality is changing uh, over the lifetime of your scanner and how it may compare to other scanners out there. Uh, fMRI prep is a robust pre-processing pipeline for functional imaging time series data. And uh, these both MRI QC and fMRI prep are being developed uh, by the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience at Stanford under the auspices of uh, Chris Gorgolevsky uh, and Oscar Esteban. But all of these tools, uh, CPAC, Mindboggle, FMI Prep, and MRIQC are all available as uh, BIDS apps, which means if you have your data in BIDS format, uh, you can point to your BIDS uh, data set and run any of these tools. And there's a whole collection of BIDS apps out there doing different kinds of things, but those were some of the more popular tools out there that one can use. Uh, to allow for uh, having consistent environments, so the container technologies allow you to keep something fairly consistent. But how do you create a container with the right set of tools? So in our group, we created something called NeuroDocker, which is a Python library or a Docker image, itself a container that you can run, that generates custom Docker files for neuroimaging software. And it's a wrapper around Docker, but it significantly simplifies writing a new Docker file. Uh, it incorporates best practices for installing software, and it supports all popular neuroimaging software at this point. Uh, AFNI, ANTS, Convert3D, uh, DCM, DICOM Conversion, FreeSurfer, uh, FSL, Mink, <coughs> uh, Python uh, libraries, MRTrix, and others. In fact, it supports access to NeuroDebian, which itself provides access to numerous neuroimaging tools that are out there. Finally, you can use this uh, tool called ReproZip, uh, which is a fun little tool that minimizes uh, containers to minimize your Docker image to be 
essential for just running an app. And here's one example of installing a very specific version of ants into a container that's based on an Ubuntu image and runs uh, uh, and, and then allows you to build that container. So now you get ANS version. So if you can run Docker, which you can today on almost any operating system, you can use NeuroDocker to create your own personal uh, neuroimaging environment specific to the tools that you need uh, for your platform. Uh, pliers is a tool being developed as part of a, a project called NeuroScout. Uh, the general idea is to extract uh, features from movies, images, text, uh, to then use uh, towards analyzing information contained when people view these movies, images, or text in a scanner. Uh, here's an example. Uh, I'll just play this for a little bit. I don't think you'll be able to hear the sound coming through, but uh, this will at least give you a sense of what Flyers is doing. Uh, there's a movie playing on the left and Plies is tracking information through the movie and you can see some of the uh, information features that it's extracting uh, on the right. So that covers at least a subset of analytics. And I, as I mentioned earlier, we use a whole lot of tools under the NiPy umbrella, but also many other open source tools that are out there in doing analytics. Uh, I do want to move into the last few components. Uh, so with visualization, uh, one of the things is that there's a whole world of things out there for neuroimaging related visualization. Uh, Seaborn and Altair are 2D uh, visualizations for scatter plots or bar plots or things of that nature that build on top of uh, matplotlib in one case or in terms of uh, a grammar of graphics uh, idea in the case of Altair. Nylon becomes, so those are general purpose tools. You can use them to visualize all kinds of uh, information as long as they're uh, in 2D form. Uh, Nylon is uh, focused on uh, neuroimaging visualization. Uh, I'll, I'll show an example in a second. And uh, it can read uh, neuroimaging images and use uh, understanding of coordinate systems and other things to represent the information in custom ways. Again, allowing you to code and generate publication quality figures uh, straight from your data. Uh, IPy Volume and Maya VR representation are 3D uh, generators of visualization. Uh, I'll be showing you some examples of at least IPy volume in this particular case, but MayaV is a very powerful Python package for visualizing 3D data. And uh, as of about a month back, it's become significantly easier to install MayaV because its primary dependency VTK, uh, which is a visualization toolkit from Kitware, has, uh, uh, and its Python bindings have become really easy to install on any cross-platform device. Uh, so one thing that has been happening in the community, and this was started by Bjorn Sergel and Jan Freiberg at a BrainHack Global last year, uh, was to create a set of widgets that you could embed in Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks to uh, do interactive visualization of neuroimaging data. So now as you're creating your Jupyter Notebook, you can actually use it to start visualizing data interactively, which may be quite useful for doing things like visual quality checks and others. And uh, we did some contributions to this during Neuro Hack Week last year that built some extensions, which I'll talk about in a second. So as you can see in this image, you can do interactive plotting of standard brain images. Uh, you can also use Nylon, and this is an example of using what's called the Nylon glass brain to show uh, images, uh, again, interactively within the context of a no notebook. Uh, you can also use uh, surface mapping. So this, while I can't show interactivity over here, uh, this is really showing a particular overlay on a inflated surface of the brain. So imagine the brain being blown up like a balloon just a little bit, not fully, otherwise it'll turn into a ball uh, if you consider it being a closed surface. Uh, 
it shows uh, and, and you can interact with this uh, as things are uh, being plotted on. So that's a nice way of interacting with surface-based formats or data. Uh, and you can also look at streamlined widgets, uh, so things that are come out of uh, processing uh, diffusion MRI. Uh, you can look at uh, uh, diffusion pathways, which are represented as these streamlines through some analytical process. Again, this is an interactive tool, and you can control it to look at different thresholds on lengths of pathways. Uh, moving on to publishing. Uh, we put our data in many, many different places. So one place that we tend to uh, submit data to is, uh, is OSF, the Open Science Framework. It's kind of a GitHub for your files and data uh, that you can use to share data with the world. And we've shared a bunch of things, including data sets that were not part of the public uh, data sets, uh, Amazon Public Data Sets program, but that we needed to share, we put within the Open Science Framework. Uh, the nice thing about both AWS and the Open Science Framework is that every file in your data set gets a URL. And this is what enables things like Datalad to pull out just the relevant pieces of information instead of downloading large tarballs. And that's quite powerful when you want to select specific things instead of downloading the entire data. Uh, for some of the data sets that are out there, they're multi terabytes now, and it would be impossible to download all the data in a reasonable amount of time. But if you're looking at very specific pieces, you might still be able to download thousands of files uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, I mentioned NiPipe on GitHub. Uh, we do all of our coding there. One of the nice things about NiPipe is it has over 130 community contributors over the years. Uh, but one thing you can do is link up GitHub to a platform called Zenodo, which can not only take uh, what I'm going to talk about with respect to NiPipe, but also other data files. Uh, but once you publish a release on GitHub, it automatically creates a DOI for you on Zenodo, uh, where people can download this specific version of NiPipe if they wanted to from a different location. But having a DOI allows you to cite the very specific version of the NiPipe software that you used in your paper as opposed to a generic version of NiPipe that would be referring to the original uh, NiPipe citation. Uh, for statistical analysis results, uh, we submit uh, our data to NeuroVault, uh, which you can use both privately and publicly to look at statistical information. The other nice thing about NeuroVault is that it accepts a data that has been generated with NIDM results. And so if you're using SPM um, and some additional tools that you can install with FSL, you can upload the results to NeuroVault directly as a NIDM uh, result bundle. And NeuroVault understands NIDM and will show you and display the different kinds of components and structures that exist uh, with NIDM. Uh, Again, people can talk about NeuroVault in much greater detail, but NeuroVault is linked to NeuroSynth, which does meta-analytic uh, analysis, and you can use NeuroSynth to decode your NeuroVault images to tell you what kind of uh, terms uh, NeuroSynth might think are associated with your contrast images. I referred to Open Neuro earlier as a place where you could get data sets, but Open Neuro is more than just sharing neuroimaging data. It also has a built-in support for uh, analyzing neuroimaging data. And if you upload your data and you agree to the terms of releasing that data at a certain point in time in the future, you get access to a whole slew of bids apps that run on the Open Neuro platform that you can then use to analyze your data in bids format. Now, you have to be in bids format to upload data to Open Neuro. Some upcoming platforms. Uh, uh, we've been doing some work as part of a center uh, that Devon mentioned in the introduction. It's called Repronym, a center for reproducible neuroimaging computation. This is an NIHP41 center that's focused on reproducibility uh, in the neuroimaging world. And uh, the specific projects that we are building on are things that have to do with data discovery. So building out a bigger search platform to find different kinds of data and results. Uh, this is a collaboration with UCSD uh, to build that out. Uh, we're doing things to represent data in structured uh, ways such that you can build analytic tools and search tools in a consistent manner. Uh, this is part of the data modeling and integration work. 
And we're also trying to take information that's out there and run analytic workflows uh, that were either prescribed or self-prescribed in certain cases, if you want to change the workflow uh, easily across different kinds of platform. And this is part of the execution environments, which will not only execute things, but also track information about the execution so you can repeatedly execute it in the same way. And finally, a big component of the center is to train and disseminate the products that are coming out of the center. So we train individuals to understand basics of reproducibility and how to do reproducible research in general. Feel free to get in touch with me if you want to uh, learn more about the efforts, especially training uh, and the software being developed, uh, but you can also go to repronim.org and contact us that way. Uh, I alluded to NeuroScout while I was talking about uh, uh, pliers. Uh, the general intent is to create a turnkey solution for rapid and flexible reanalysis of fMRI data. Now, the focus is on naturalistic fMRI, in particular, people watching movies uh, rather than uh, uh, so things that are in more ecological settings rather than the typical fMRI where you show one stimuli and then you show another stimuli and you try to compare things. Um, naturalistic fMRI data has a lot of advantages in trying to understand the complexities of interaction in the brain, and pliers is a tool that helps uh, extract information out of those movies so that you can then relate it to the brain imaging data acquired. But in general, one of the nice things about this project is it builds on various platforms that many of us have been working on, whether it's NiPipe, OpenFMRI, or OpenNeuro, the BIDS data format, and DataLad or NeuroDebian. And it brings these all together in a seamless way, such that individuals can just point to the kinds of questions or hypotheses they want to test, uh, whether it's looking at this particular movie, uh, but turning it into brain images uh, that illustrate uh, specific ways of analyzing the movie from an individual standpoint. Uh, I think this is the last thing. Uh, the one thing that we would like to push for is the idea that there's a lot of tools that I've co covered in the last 40-ish minutes. Um, but there's a lot of training that needs to happen together with these tools. And as part of that, we've started building these open courses in data science for neuroscience. Uh, so we have a few things out there, mostly introductory materials looking at uh, machine learning, visualization, um, and uh, neural data in the context of uh, intracortical recordings. Uh, but this is an effort we would like to see the community embrace and start improving these materials to convey different kinds of things that people uh, want to educate other people on. And Excuse I think- Excuse me, Dr. Ghosh? Yeah. I don't want to interrupt you mid-thought, um, but we have someone that's leaving the session and they okay. would love to send you an email. Is there an email I could put into the uh, group chat for you? Sure, it's satra at mit.edu. Satra at mit.edu. All right, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no problem. I'm almost there. It's no, no, no minute. worries. No worries. Not at all. I just didn't want them to jump off before they got your intel. Sure. And um, they say they say thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so I, uh, I think this is an area where we really want to improve. Uh, these are set up with Docker containers, which you can download and run these uh, courses on your own computer, but uh, hopefully we'll also have them easily be runnable through the MyBinder service as well so that you can learn about these things online. So we'll be doing a little bit of work over the summer uh, about these courses to try and improve them. Uh, but if anybody wants to contribute, we really welcome contributions and moving these things forward. Uh, I think that covers uh, pretty much all the tools we use in our group, or many of the tools we use in our group. Uh, I want to summarize by there are plenty of technologies out there from simply thinking about a problem to all the way to producing scientific results. Uh, one of the things I should point out is that these tools are at different maturity levels. So uh, there may be some growing pains with some of them, but in general, most of the things that I've covered are fairly mature tools out there. It also brings together the incredibly strong community of developers that we have. And I would highly encourage anybody uh, who wants to improve these tools to get involved. Uh, and finally, for many people who don't feel like uh, they need to pick up these different tools, my suggestion would be that spending a month or two or three 
learning these things is well worth the time, uh, especially if you consider the longer time frame of academic uh, research. So I would definitely encourage you to spend the time focusing on each of these tools and learning about things, because once you get those things under your grasp, uh, analysis uh, of data and being able to ask the right questions and doing the right things becomes a lot easier. So with that, I'll stop and I'll take any questions. Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you for the very informative webinar. I know uh, we had some very interested participants today. Uh, we do have a few questions, so I'll just get right into them. Um, do you imagine that reproducible neuroimaging data analysis will require Docker, Data Lab, or Singularity? If so, first question is, what is the percentage of the imaging community that are already doing this, if you know it? And uh, there's another question, but I guess we can just start there. <laughs> sure. I, I, in, in the ideal world, it shouldn't require any specific tool set. It's just that these tool sets help with creating reproducible or versioned environments, which allows reproducibility. In fact, uh, I would say you want to go beyond reproducibility. You want to go towards generalizability, which is the idea that the, the scientific results that you're trying to get at hold independent of data environment operating system. Uh, and, and that's what you want to aim towards. But in the limited context, you at least want to know that the same thing that you're running uh, gives you the same result. And that's not consistently the case across neuroimaging. In terms of the, uh, the community using uh, some of these tools, I think it's fairly small at this point in time. I wouldn't be able to give an, a, a realistic number. Uh, we are doing various kinds of uh, training workshops and other things that increase that number and spread the message. Uh, but I do think that people may be using some of these things without realizing it. So for example, if somebody does upload data set to Open Neuro and analyzes it with a bids app, which is actually running in containerized form. So it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is, knows they're using Docker, but they're using Docker under the hood or Singularity under the hood. Hopefully that answers the question. I definitely think it does. And uh, just to follow up on that, what do you think the gap is in training that you see as the biggest problem in the neuroimaging field? I think some of it is taking the time to learn something that uh, somebody's uncomfortable with to start with. And that's why I kind of ended on the note that if you can take the one, two or three months uh, to learn some of these things, I think you'll end up finding that it's well worth it. But very few people, I think, uh, it's, I think mostly it's a social or cultural thing that taking a month away to do something I'm uncomfortable or unfamiliar with is not always, uh, readily available in the context of PhD students or postdocs trying to get papers out. Uh, I do think that if you think of education in a general purpose sense, and these computational platforms are as equally important as basic neuroscience or cognitive science training. Coming from the perspective of the open patient, uh, do you think that it's useful to anyone to have a collection from patients themselves for 1.5T MRI images, which are still the standard of practice for most doctor's offices, offices. Are these sorts of scans useful to neuroimaging or would they be of resolution that is too low for most neuroimaging needs? So I think for uh, many things, it depends on the questions being asked. It turns out that 1.5 Tesla images just by themselves are not necessarily pure resolution, but some of the clinical resolutions that are collected uh, come in a form that may not be useful beyond the particular clinical case. So uh, while this is changing as we speak, uh, a lot of the early uh, scans that were done w had uh, fairly high in-plane resolution. So if you're thinking of slices of the brain, with, within each slice, the resolution was high, but each slice was fairly thick. Whereas uh, mu much of the scans we are getting these days are uh, what are called isotropic resolution uh, and hence have much higher resolution than they used to before. Uh, I mean, we are nowhere close to neural resolution, but I think whether something is useful or not uh, is a function of uh, what kind of applications they would be applied to. 
when it comes to clinical scans, if I could magically wish all of them to be available or all the people who have scans to upload them somewhere, I am fairly positive that there will be use cases where they will be useful. I just can't guarantee that it'll be useful for everything. Excellent. And uh, last two questions, I think they kind of tail together. Uh, with lots of tools, how do I know what to use with what pipelines? And are there significant problems when these tools get mismatched? So I think that is partly an issue with some of these tools, uh, since almost everything, uh, uh, I shouldn't say almost everything, many things in the neuroimaging software world are developed in isolation as opposed to thinking about interoperability across tools. Uh, one of the things that has definitely helped is the idea of the, is the nifty standard to bring tools together, at least to uh, conform to data in a specific way, but that standard is fairly limited in how it represents uh, information. And so there's def there are definitely possibilities of tools getting mismatched. Uh, I think that's where the community part of it comes in and the training part of it comes in, that there is a lot of experience and expertise in the community of how to match these tools are. And one particular example I'll give is the fMRI prep and MRI QC software, which tries to leverage uh, some of the best tools out there, best algorithms out there, uh, to process data, whether for finding quality metrics or for processing uh, functional imaging data in an optimal way across a wide range of data sets that are out there. Excellent. Well, that is it for our questions. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for an excellent webinar. This was very informative. And I want to tell, thank our uh, audience for joining us. Uh, we have recorded this webinar. I'm going to edit it slightly and then we're going to put it on YouTube and um, along with all of our other webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, we do not have a webinar for next week. Our next one will be on April 27th, but please keep checking our new info upcoming webinars website because I am constantly sending out emails, updating, so we may actually get a webinar before then. Um, Dr. Ghosh, at this moment, is there anything else you'd like to add in regards to this webinar? Uh, no, nothing in particular. I'll share with you the PDF of the slides. Uh, so That'd that be great. You can link to, and anybody can reach me. Um, pretty relatively easy to find. And a, I have a question in the chat. Will this be recorded and sent out? Yes, it will be. It'll be on YouTube, which is available through our upcoming webinars uh, link, which is just above your question in the group chat. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ghosh. And uh, I'll look forward to those uh, slides. Um, and uh, yeah, have an excellent weekend. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Devon and Anita for inviting. I hope this was fun. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>